All right, guys. Mike has got a lot of words here. Some of them are pretty abrasive. Some of them are really helpful. And that's what we're actually going to focus on on this episode. This is where hope drops. And he does it in a really interesting way. So before we set about looking at the text, let me read a couple of things that help us orient us to hope. This is from Ralph L. Smith. Hope to be hope must be oriented toward the future. Micah speaks often of the present evil situation, the greed and fraud of the merchants, the crimes of land grabbers, the corruption of spiritual leaders, in addition to the ominous approach of an enemy nation, all present a dark picture. But the prophet said that those conditions will not prevail forever. Judgment would come, but a saved, chastened, and faithful remnant would survive. A new king from the line of David would be born in Bethlehem and replace the present weak king on the throne. He would reign in the majesty and the name of Yahweh. His people would dwell securely and he would be great to the ends of the earth. So we've got hope in Micah coming. Amazing, beautiful hope. A picture of a coming king whom these people wouldn't get to meet in their lifetime, but who we now understand is referring to this infant this baby, this newborn in a, in a stable in Bethlehem. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Yes, that child has hope uh, all around him. As we come to realize that all of our hopes, as they're fulfilled in what God is doing through Christ Jesus, we rejoice in that. But that doesn't sound like the kind of hope that people expected right back then. Uh, if you're in a broken world and you're like, well, yeah, there's this baby that's going to be born, but that's on the horizon, right? So, so how did this hope affect the people around them in the here and now? And, and, and for us, even as we, we, we know that Jesus's return is on the horizon, how, how does the, the hope of, of our faith affect the concrete here and now? Let's look at Brueggemann's take on this. The prophet must speak metaphorically about hope, but concretely about the real newness that comes to us and redefines our situation. So guys, the Christian hope will redefine your situation. What the Bible speaks about, the presence of God, the, the character of God, the activity, the salvation narrative of God that comes to, to weave our stories into his, all of this actually redefines where we are in the here and now. So let's watch how Micah drops these amazing glimpses of hope into the most stark and, and really dire circumstances in which he speaks. Man, he is an artist at spitting bars. He does this through contrast, something we could call juxtaposition. You know what contrast is? It's when there's like something's really bright and something's really dark and it's like high contrast, like something's really bright, something's really dark. It's a bit jarring in the book of Micah. I don't know if you've noticed that, but he, he tends to pit these things back to back uh, to highlight that, that in the, the darkest is when we see the lightest thing coming. So uh, perhaps I could quote John Foreman here per usual. The shadow proves the sunshine. So you guys ready? Doom and hope back to back facing each other. It's great. Micah is really good at this art. So let's read the poet prophet as he puts these juxtapositions into position and maybe it can stir us some introspection. I'm trying to make it rhyme, but it's just a deflection of the fact that I don't know where the sentence is ending. So uh, well, sorry about that. Let's 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 go. Let's go. All right. Doom. This is uh, Micah chapter two, verse three through five. Therefore, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourself. You will no longer walk proudly for it will be a time of calamity. Pause real quick. Remember, God's judgment here is for the sake of their humiliation, for the sake of their humbling. And that's exactly what he's talking about doing here. In that day, people will ridicule you. They will taunt you with this mournful song. 
We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me, assigns our fields to traders. Therefore, you will have no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by lot. And back up against that, right? That's just a, a few verses away from here in, in 2.12 through 13. It's like, you know, it's, it's jarring. It's like super doom, super hope. Here we go. We have this hopeful word. I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I'll bring them together like sheep in a pen, like flock to its pasture. The place will throng with people. The one who breaks open the way will go before them. They will break through the gates and go out. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. So just as God is saying, I'm going to take away where you're at and humiliate you. He's saying, I'm going to bring you back like a, like a shepherd would. I'm going to gather you together. And so we, we get this sense that, that never lose sight of this. God's activity that, that feels negative, right? I'm going to, I'm going to take you away or you know, I'm going to bring about calamity or a disaster. The reason he does this is redemptive motives. So the doom that they're about to experience is to create a situation where the glorious mercy of God can be shown and they would return to him. All right, let's see this pattern play through again. A doom section, Micah 2.12. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. This is the place where, where God's temple was located here in Jerusalem, kind of a center point. And, and God's saying he's going to allow that to be, to be plowed like a field. It's just not, it's going to be a heap of rubble. That's, that's really jarring doom imagery, right? And just up against that. This is 2.12. Just up against that. This is what he says back to back. The contrast, doom and hope. He says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that when we may walk in his paths, the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So after, at the moment that he breathes into to Micah, this prophecy that the, the temple is going to be flattened, plowed, a heap of rubble, he says it's going to be higher than anything else, that the world's going to stream to it, that my mission to, to redeem Redeem the world is going to continue on the place I've selected. You can't ruin my plan, is what God is saying. So if my plan is a plan of hope, yeah, there may be some phases of this plan that are going to be incredibly uncomfortable for you because I'm going to humiliate and humble you. But it's, it's, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, to let the world see my goodness. So get with the program. Did you see this, this juxtaposition, this jarring contrast that's in Micah? I just think it's noteworthy that he puts these back to back together. This image of the rubble of Jerusalem right next to the image of Jerusalem being a, a mountain in which the world streams to coming to know the proximity, the closeness, the richness, the, the beauty the love of God. And let's read a little bit more of these hopeful sections. He will judge between many peoples and settle many disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. I mean, did you catch this? The, the beauty of, 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 what is this, like global peace? Like, uh, sh you know, this is like shalom uh, to the max, to the, 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 the you know, swords into plowshares. The, the, this is where God wants to go with things. This is where he's aiming. Well, I mean, and, and speaking this in, in such a time of, of high tension of, of, of global conflict and, and the, the subsequent generations of these people facing Assyria and then Babylon and then Greece and then Rome, right? And even today, this is still a word of hope for us today. I hope you're keeping that in mind, that God's global shalom will be a reality. So let that speak into your doom. I don't know how you're feeling with things the way the world is today, but let this speak into your doom. <laughs>
a word of hope. So let's go back to another Doom section. Micah 5 1. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. And right up against that, right up against that passage. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the Lord his God. And they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. We will raise against them seven shepherds, even eight commanders, who will rule the land of Assyria with sword, the land of Nimrod with drawn sword. He will deliver us from the Assyrians when they invade our land and march across our borders. And, and so this would have been a really hopeful word as the doom that we talked about. Hey, dude, siege is coming. Uh, Assyria is coming. They, they were known for their siege works. Take heart because there is hope in one who is coming and this prophecy wouldn't be fulfilled for a very long time but this is this is god's way into the darkness sometimes we got there by our own demise but whatever it is that darkness god is doing something in it and he's showing us the light the shadow proves the sunshine amen john foreman god is weaving hope unimaginable in the dire and dark circumstances of our lives so as we hear the, the poet prophet speak these juxtapositions, take hope, take hope, my brothers and sisters, that no matter where you're at with your faith or with things, uh, with the world around you, with injustices, with the, the wars, the darkness around you, I promise you, as the prophet does, I promise you that, that God can give you hope and, and he can do it in a way that, that illuminates and redefines our situation. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is working about all things for the good of those who love him, as Paul says in Romans? Let's hold on to that hope and it will redefine our situation. The remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers in the grass, which do not wait for anyone or depend on man. The remnant of Jacob will be among the nations in the midst of the many peoples like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of the field, which mauls and mangles as it goes, and no one can rescue. Your hand will be lifted up in triumph over your enemies, and all your foes will be destroyed. We need to keep this in mind, that in the dark times, the hope of the Lord shines even brighter. In the brink of war, we hear about swords being beaten to plowshares. The, the, the hope for shalom is true in any darkness, that God is bringing about the reconciliation of all things to Christ. That needs to be spoken into darkness. It could be darkness in, in our lives and in, in our hearts and our minds and our families and our communities and our world. Into what darkness does God's hope speak to today? Let's name the darknesses, the doom, the places where we feel lack of hope. Let's name them that we may let the hope, the light of God come into those places. One more John Foreman quote. The wound is where the light shines through. I believe that. So what's that dark spot, that scar that needs attention? Is it a wound in you? Is it a wound in your family? Is it a wound in the community around you? Is it a wound in our nation? Where are those wounds that we need the light to shine through and the hope of God to penetrate and redefine our situation? Would you dare to hope with us as we attend to the word of God and are inspired by the prophet Micah to see that there is no darkness in which hope does not follow. When we're with God, hope shines through. Embrace it. We'll see you next time on Spitting Bars.